We are hugely grateful for Tom coming to speak today about the challenges of climate change for West Berkshire. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming him to the conference, Tom Heap. Thank you very much indeed. It felt a little bit like uh, Countryfile watching that film just there, didn't it? You probably expected me to, or someone to, to wander about and do a stop and do a pointless piece to camera on a style or something like that. Now you're probably all ready for Antiques Roadshow rather than me. But uh, sorry, I'm on what you've got. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, as uh, Richard has just outlined, it's a very, very interesting and challenging time. Uh, for, uh, for the planet, for countries, for counties, for councils, for individuals, for businesses. Um, please forgive me, I'm fighting a little bit of a sore throat, so I will be stopping to drink every now and then. <coughs> so I hope to be a little bit hopey changey, as has just been uh, encouraged. However, I'm also intending to deliver a bit of a dose of realism on the scale of the challenge. Not so much the scale of the challenge in terms of the science and the planet, although I will talk about that. I'm talking about the, change, the scale of the challenge facing society and what it really means to uh, move towards a lower carbon economy and uh, delivering some truth behind the claim of uh, putting your council's name to a climate emergency. So the context, um, I don't want to talk too much about um, what's happening to, uh, to our planet. I think the broad facts are very well known. It is very simple, the amount of con carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases is increasing. This raises the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide, the literal parts per million increases. If you like, it is as simple as the thickness of the jersey around the world is getting thicker and denser and therefore does a better job at keeping the heat in. We made this point uh, on a panorama a few years ago to climate change denial scientists and even they can't dispute the, the three basic facts, which is that carbon dioxide and methane are greenhouse gases. We are emitting more of them than we used to, and therefore there are more of them in the atmosphere that are measured by their parts per million in clean places like Hawaii. Those sort of things are completely undeniable. And the results of that are fairly clear as well. The most obvious ones are the steady increase in temperature, the uh, shrinking of the ice caps, uh, or ice cap in the, in the north, in the Arctic, and sea ice extent and ice thickness, and the speed of movement of glaciers on the uh, Antarctic, and of course at the recession of glaciers in many of our mountainous areas. On top of that, we have sea level rise, which is currently quite slow, but could well increase in speed quite dramatically if we lose large volumes of ice and uh, ocean acidification, which matters for the species within it, not least uh, the, uh, the coral reefs, anything with a shell basically uh, doesn't like things acidic because you can dissolve shells with acid so they don't get on terribly well with, with more acidified seas. Um, we have species loss. Um, some of this was mentioned uh, sort of in passing by Richard just now, but globally there are some places where um, uh, species are really, really suffering from climate change. If you like the cold and you live on a mountain, you get closer and closer to the top because that's where the cold goes and then eventually you have nowhere to go. Um, and uh, we do, <coughs> excuse me, we do of course um, have extreme weather. And it's quite an interesting one. Uh, I, I was talking to, to Steve, the, the, the Council of the Responsibility of the Environment here, and you know, Richard, um, excuse me, extreme weather is not just a challenge for Japan. You know, it's a challenge for West Berkshire. You have flooding here, both flash flooding and uh, and uh, winter or autumn. Uh, you know, persistent flooding can be a danger in you know the, the, the Kennet and, and even on the, the Thames, which I know is bo no borders the uh, borders the region. So these things really matter in this area as well. And then, of course, the other effect of, of climate change is its effect on people elsewhere, and we know that affects um, us. 
because of global displacement of populations who are a greater threat, immediate threat from climate change than we are, and, um, uh, and then of, often seek to move because life in there where they currently live or where they were born has become intolerable for various reasons. And it's worth remembering, I was just looking at some of the uh, population growth stats, the global population growth stats, an extraordinary proportion of the predicted, predicted growth in global population comes from areas which are, are, or are likely to be some of the most vulnerable to climate change. So global population is roughly 7.5 billion now. Uh, the, the best predictions of the population experts is it will rise to about 9.5, 10 billion at about 2050, 60. An enormous proportion of that growth comes from Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, an area which is likely to be particularly strongly threatened by uh, climate change, and as we know, we're already seeing large numbers of migrants from that area of the world, which create political instability in their own countries and in ours. Uh, whatever your view of whether we should accept them or not, you cannot deny there is a human uh, anguish there, and for them, and also, as we've seen in Europe, political consequences for us as well. So that is the huge um, other impact of climate change. And, of course, we've seen the recent political reactions to that, whether it be the growth of uh, Extinction Rebellion or the, the power of the words and presence of, of, of Greta Thunberg. Uh, and um, you know, in, in the, the political parties know this, and it's not, uh, it's not just the Greens. Uh, throughout the political spectrum, I believe research has been done uh, particularly for the Conservative Party, saying this is the biggest concern for younger people. So, I mean, many of them have been singing this hymn for quite a while, if you're Richard Bennett. Others are more la later converts in the Conservative Party. But uh, I think, really, the message is getting through across the political spectrum. This is something they need to be concerned about, whether for genuine passion or enlightened self-interest. I don't care if they're going to be concerned about it. That's great. And, of course, environmental concern is good for those of us journalists who work in the environment area. That's yeah, all very good. We can actually get to, get to see the boss of the channel every now and then and tell him we should be doing more about climate change, which is something I've certainly been trying to do for the last uh, year or two. And interestingly, you mentioned Hopi Changey. My message is, and this is where I do sometimes uh, part company with some of the campaign groups around there, I think the message needs to be one of hope and potential and what we can do and what we are doing uh, rather than uh, f focusing maybe a little bit too heavily on the threat and the danger and the anger, which can lead to feelings of guilt and impotence amongst people, and I'll come on to that a little bit in the talk. Because what I really want to do is, the brief I was given is kind of look at see what a, a, a what can a local council do about this, uh, what it can do, what it can't do, what the challenges are. Um, now, I've never worked in local politics, and that way I'm kind of just the wrong person to ask this, so maybe i better go. Uh, so some of my advice, forgive me, might be rather uh, naive. Uh, please uh, forgive me on that, but I hope you'll take it as an outsider's view of excuse me, some suggestions of, of some directions you might go. Now, you have declared a climate emergency here in West Berkshire, and you have an aim to be carbon neutral by 2030, which ain't long. I'll say 11 years, um, nearly 10. Uh, very, very close indeed. And I understand that the, uh, the line is, the climate emergency requires the council to work with businesses and residents and request the government to provide it with the powers and resources to achieve that goal, the 2030 goal. So can it be done and how can it be done? So this is where things are going to get really tough. The declaration quite obviously it was the easy part, the delivery will sky you. It will be tough. It will be really, really tough. Why will it be tough? Because our civilization is built on fire. And fire is basically what we've got to snuff out if we're going to sort this climate change. In what way is it built on fire? Just about every single um, thing that we do in our lives is based on energy, the greater access to energy, and that from wood to coal to oil to gas has been built on the greater use of fire and burning stuff. Now, we are seeing changes to that now, and I'll come on to it later. 
but an awful lot of the things we take for granted in our lives and lifestyles are based on that. And this is why climate change has been referred to as a wicked problem. It is because the, you know, the, the production of carbon dioxide particularly is so rooted in every way that we do our lives, be it our decision to have children to our decision to go for a run. The, both those activities, physical activities, emit more carbon dioxide. However, clearly the opposite of those things is something that is faintly unpalatable. So, you know, there are really, the, the extremes, there are very, very difficult choices to be made here. And this matters to politicians because what we um, are seeing at the moment is an undoubted uh, rise in passion and anger from a percentage of the population. Now, uh, it's very difficult to say what percentage of the population are deeply animated by these things. Um, uh, clearly, XR and the school strikes are popular, but when you look at the population as a whole, they're not a great number of people. And politicians, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, have to be worried about broad swathes of the electorate. Are they going to bring them with them on the journey, or are they not? And so it's really how to make this transition while stinging, still bringing as many people along, uh, which is, is, is particularly possible. Because I am not convinced that the people of Britain or Berkshire are really ready yet to radically change their lifestyles to achieve this goal. You may say that's a shame, but currently I think it's probably the truth. So, I want to look at, uh, in how we're going to, how this can be done, I just want to briefly look at some of the successes and some of the, the failures that we've seen in, adapt, in uh, addressing climate change in the last few years. Um, now, some of these were, were hinted at by Richard a moment ago. So let's look at some of the successes, because, as I say, there have been some good things that have been done in terms of climate change, and these things should not be ignored. So, um, it is a fact that uh, uh, today the UK emits roughly the same amount of carbon dioxide as it did in 1894, which was when the uh, internal combustion engine was invented. And mainly the reason that we have achieved that success in getting down to that level is because we burn much, much less coal. And that is a very good thing. I think I heard the campaigners at the front putting coal at the top of their list of what we should get rid of, and they could not be more right. Coal is, if you like, the great Satan. When it comes to climate change, there is no doubt about it. Now, one, so we've got rid of a lot of coal. Uh, we don't burn it in our homes, we don't burn it in our factories. On the factory point, it is true to say that one of the reasons that we l emit less carbon is we don't make as much stuff as we did, and some of that stuff will be made by, be, be, being made by coal-powered factories in China. So let's not get too uh, smug about the whole thing, but on the whole there is, there is a good story to be told about, um, uh, about that. Um, La the, in the last quarter of the year, uh, sorry, the third quarter of the year, of this year, um, for the first time we emitted, m we, sorry, we um, generated more energy through renewable sources than fossil sources. Once again, something hugely to be celebrated. Every time you switch on the lights, those lights there will be, uh, each time they're switched on, or rather, sorry, for every moment they're kept on, they will be emitting half the amount of carbon, or excuse me, the electricity that generated them to, to, to keep them on, is emitting half the amount of carbon that it did eight to ten years ago. That is a great success. You know, renewables are, have been a great success in this country. Uh, we've recently seen that the, the, the price of offshore wind, the so-called um, uh, the contract price that they're promising to produce the next generation of offshore, offshore wind for, the next uh, build of offshore wind, is lower than the current price or grid price of electricity. So there are huge strides being made here. Um, and it's not just in energy generation, there have been some other successes. These are partly down to Europe as much as the UK. For instance, the average, pri the average emissions from uh, cars is going down. There are strict regulations on car manufacturers, how they have to push the average emissions of their production fleet down. These things have had a success. A lot of these are down, some of these, a lot of these are down to uh, technology and engineering. 
coupled with politics, coupled with financial incentives. Now, those three things are what really, really can drive some successful change, and it is why the uh, campaigners and a lot of people are right to, to focus on uh, politics and business and uh, science, because those are where we get a lot of the changes from. Um, look at some of the failures in recent years. I mean, some of them are obvious. Just to pick up on somewhere that I left off, um, average, the, 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 the average um, emissions from cars has gone down, but we've developed a passion for four-wheel drives and SUVs. That fights in the opposite direction. And this is something that, as, as individuals, we have appear to have a desire for. Quite how that was driven, why you need a car with a little bit of extra height and, and a little bit of extra weight and the ability to drive in mud when you probably never go near it, I don't quite know. Uh, but I feel myself, I'm not immune to these uh, pulls and these, these desires myself, but it is a perplexing thing. So the SUV trend, we're flying more obviously than we did. That continues to increase very, very dramatically. Uh, we like uh, consumerism in general, fast fashion in particular, clothes and things like that, that turnaround, you know, the delivery, the delivery world. And this is why, um, I'll just, sorry, just to finish this list, food, food waste, we've got a, got a problem with home energy efficiency hasn't been as much of a success as it should have been in terms of driving the energy savings from our homes. And this is hints at why I think some of these things are going to be complicated. Because a lot of the things that we haven't done so well on are related to our own behavior and our own appetites and our own desires as individuals. To be honest, a lot of things we have done well on, we haven't had to change our behavior at all. I can still flick that switch and get half the amount of carbon that I did 10 years ago. I haven't had to change. I haven't had to think about it. It's been delivered to us. So some of those things that have been successful have been delivered, you know, without us having to truly engage in how they've been done. And so I think now making this change is, is, is going to be difficult. Because uh, it's the things largely, just to recap, that have involved legislation, taxation, and regulation that have delivered the changes that we've seen them up till now. And coupled with the science and technology of the reducing price of these things has really, really made the difference. So why is it so difficult for it to give up stuff? What, what, what's, what, what's, the, what's the problem here? Um, we, the, the environmental, I mean, this is a bit of a, a, a cliche, but the environmental movement has kind of been singing much the same tune, essentially, since its inception. Something's wrong, it's probably your fault, and you should probably give up something you like in order to reverse this. Now, sadly, you could argue that hasn't worked. We eat more, heat more, drive more, fly more, buy more, and bin more in that last 50 years. So something isn't really getting through. It's not really working. And one of my concerns about some of the current campaigning strategies is I'm not convinced that turning up the volume on that tune necessarily will have the desired, eff desired effect on the broad popul broader population. I was the other day at a, uh, somewhat bizarrely, in fact you might have seen it if anyone saw Countryfile last night, um, I was at a truck racing event in, uh, in South Wales, for Countryfile actually, it was to do with children in need, it was a ramble for children in need. It was the most weird thing I've ever been to, I think, uh, really, uh, as a sport. Well, I have to say, it was quite fun in a sort of mad, guilty, petrol-headed kind of way. There were these uh, trucks running, uh, basically the things you see on the motorways, but just the tractor unit with, with, without, the, uh, without the, the wagon on the back, going around this track, careering off, occasionally bumping into each other, going into the mud. And I said, to, I said to the folk there, um, you know, what would you think if this, if this sport were kind of outlawed? Because basically you're burning fuel for fun. Um, and they were pretty horrified uh, by the notion. I said, what would you think if, they, if um, people, you know, developed trucks or the trucks that you would have were electric or hydrogen or had some kind of technological solution? They were like, yeah, that could work. So I think... Sometimes the words technological fix are sort of used as a slur in green circles to say that it's somehow getting us off the hook of sacrifice. 
Well, I don't think people are very good at sacrifice, and I would rather they, you know, they, we delivered the low carbon somehow rather than necessarily chaining everybody to a certain kind of behaviour, which I think will be difficult and may end up in people not getting elected. I mean, just take an example like water saving as well. I know this isn't a climate change one, but we're quite bad at saving water. You know, what's worked up to a point is those water saving taps. And then people then try and sell you these showers that are like being in a um, tropical monsoon. Suddenly, you know, we, we choose to use more water. So we're quite bad at doing these things. Even things that would save our own lives, moving aside from having to worry about the next generation, let's just worry about our own longevity, things to do with consumption of you know, fat or sugar or things like that. Well, terrible, you know, that adverts, you know, you, where someone is seen to be a good person because they buy their parent a massive bar of chocolate. You know, we, we are in this world where things that we like are, 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 are worshipped. And uh, it's very, very difficult to get rid of that. But just, you know, keeping on that theme, what has worked? The sugar tax. Suddenly, people start reformulating what they're doing. The companies reformulate it, it comes down. So there is a massive role for government and maybe local government in all this as well. Um, the uh, lady who chaired the uh, Paris uh, Climate Agreement, which was considered to be a success, Christiana Figueres, had a line with, uh, uh, about, uh, about sacrifice not being an enabling thought. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't look at our own lives and th think about things that we could change. But I'm putting it out there that as a kind of, to make it the core of your message, be you a politician or be you a, a green group, putting it in the shop window is not, I don't think, necessarily going to get you the sales or the supporters that you want. And just on the other side, it also enables those who don't agree with you at all to portray you, to portray you know, the old slur of, oh, they want us to go back and live in a cave, they want to take all our fun away, the whole sort of slur of people who are concerned about the environment being killjoys, it unfortunately gives a little bit of traction to that slur. Now, there may be some shift in this. You know, there may be a, a greater willingness, as we're seeing with greater concern, to, uh, to move the sort of dial a little bit on that metric. Uh, but, as I say, I have my doubts. You have, you, you, you have to you know, look at the, you know, the start of the Gilets Jaunes protest in, in France was to do with fuel prices rising. People are not necessarily on, uh, immediately on board with this stuff, and I think you have to be careful of assuming that the depth of concern is as deep as you might like. Sometimes it's quite uh, skin deep, so we have to bring people along. Um, I think I, I, I saw a... Uh, I saw a quote from a, a person in your, in your council, um, maybe here today, Adrian Abs, the Lib Dems, all, the, all your solutions should be carrot-based. Uh, I'm not sure, that, uh, I guess as opposed to stick. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that's opposed, as opposed to saying everything should be as in diets based on carrots. But uh, I think the, the, the way this becomes particularly uncomfortable and arguably where the the Gilets Jaunes um, uh, parallel has some relevance, is people are particularly sensitive to when they think they're being asked to do something or give up something, when it's slightly hypocritical on the basis of those who are asking, doing the asking, if it's politicians or if it's those in power or if it's those in wealth who seem to be asking this. So the social justice element of this is going to be really, really important if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring people with you. Um, because envy and hypocrisy, or the, the feeling of envy and the suspicion of hypocrisy are very, very potent uh, passions in people. And they're also things that are sort of passions, if you like, or that are particularly loved by journalism as well. So journalists will also sort of amplify those things because it's, a, it's sort of catnip to us. So making this change is going to take, you know, real political smart. It's going to be, you know, really, really challenging to deliver this. And I do hope, 
obviously I hope you do. I was speaking to a good, very good friend of mine who's in a, in a, in a different council who decided they, who's very concerned about the environment, but he decided they wouldn't, or rather not he decided, the council decided they wouldn't declare a, a climate emergency uh, because they felt that they wanted to think about the delivery before the statement. Now, uh, I hope that your declaration of a climate emergency here will be the, if you like, the stick with which you beat yourselves, not, not your electorate, that it, you know, it encourages you to, 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 to move in that, in that direction, or it's a sort of constant, if you like, a, a constant tailwind uh, trying to move you in that direction. So what can we do, or what can you do in, in West Berkshire? Well, um, the, I suppose the, 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 real, uh, the real problem here is how much or how little you control as a council. Um, and now I'm not an, as I say again, I'm not an expert on precisely where that boundary lies, but I know that is a, a tricky boundary and it's something that, that councils often run up against. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the areas where um, change could be made and uh, I'm sure you will have views about whether I'm being you know, hopelessly uh, naive about or hopelessly optimistic about the level of your power or, or, or not. Um, uh, it's interesting, uh, Richard j just said just now, just now that the, the Energy Minister, Claire Perry, was sort of suggesting that councils should be more ambitious about this um, and that, you know, uh, the feeling that government wasn't standing in their way. Well, let's, uh, let's prove, let's, if you like, uh, prove her wrong and, and, and be ambitious and then make it clear that the government is the stumbling block rather than the local uh, authority, the local council. So uh, on the map, obviously, I don't need to tell you, but I was just refreshing, refreshing my mind about what's in, uh, uh, what's in uh, West Berkshire, obviously, A4, M4, um, Newbury, Pangbourne, Hungerford, Thatcham, lots and lots of villages, Cheveley services, rivers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so where, you know, the most obvious thing, if you like, um, is, is housing, council housing, buildings which you have responsibility for. What are you insisting on in terms of the regulations when things are being built? Be they homes, be they offices. What are you able to insist on? What could you push harder on insisting on? If, you, if you're pushing for a certain level of regulation but you're being blocked, make it clear that you're being blocked. This is what you wish to achieve and this is who or what is standing in your way. In your council, I don't know if you have much council house stock here, forgive me, but if, uh, when you do, obviously you have con you know, considerable levels of control over that, and even if it's um, a housing association, you often have some kind of um, controls over those too. Now, the government has just introduced this, this future home standard, which is currently consulting on it now, which is uh, a recognition, I think, by this administration, they need to really get back in the game when it comes to ensuring uh, new houses are of a higher um, environmental standard, having rather you know, dropped the ball with the zero carbon by 2016 uh, pledge that, that disappeared um, quite a while ago. I'm not sure under whose watch it was on. I'm sure Richard wasn't in favour of dropping it. But rumour has it that it, uh, it was dropped under pressure, particularly from the house builders, and that pressure will come again when we try and raise standards, because they will suck their teeth and say, well, yes, Minister, I can deliver these things, but I'll be delivering you half the number of houses that you want, or whatever figure they choose. So they'll try and hold them over the barrel. If you want a lot of houses, you keep banging on about building 300,000 houses a year. The way to do that is to take the uh, environmental handcuffs off us. Now, that is, a, that is a national battle, but I suspect that is a, it's scaled down, that is probably a local battle as well, that the, the harder you push. But it, it's kind of frustrating because the, co the marginal cost of putting things like solar panels, either, um, either um, electric or thermal ones, ones that heat water, which actually I'm a big fan of as well. I think they can be really, really good. Um, you know, the marginal cost when you're building a building is tiny, uh, and that is the time to do it. And that's the same time to do it when you're, you know, if you're disturbing, I know um, ground source heat pumps are a bit less in favor at the moment, but if you're, if you're building something and you've got the diggers on site, you know, that's the time to do it. The extra cost is minute. Uh, so it'd be really, really good to, to to move in, in that direction. Um, and there are other things. Obviously, there's the existing stock as well, and that's harder to, 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 to deal with, but you know, it, it, anything that can incentivize doing that uh, should be 
should be uh, encouraged. And, and Richard once again mentioned you know whole streets going going solar and things like that. And those kind of local community initiatives would be would be very very good indeed. Um, uh, the the problem one of the problems and it is linked on to kind of energy where I'm coming on to in a minute is the fact is and it always sounds rather uncomfortable to say this but for the bulk of the population energy is too cheap to bother saving it it is very true that for us for a for a proportion of the population it is very very expensive and they really do look after it but this is a it's a tricky economic political thing this because I you know I've done programs about energy saving as you can imagine more than one and plenty and when you talk to people you know it's all about how quickly will it will I get a return on this well because energy is so cheap it'll take you you know well, depending what it is but it'll take you tens or twenties of years in which case people aren't interested and it's not a big enough hit in their bill at the moment Especially, probably, I'm, I'm sure there are areas of real deprivation in West Berkshire, but it's a relatively affluent area. And getting people to do it for, for, for reasons of saving money, I think, is always going to be quite tricky. Um, energy, yeah, so I uh, mentioned it in passing, but obviously when it comes to, you know, the, the, I had a look at the... Um, council's list of properties that you, that, that you own, and there's an awful lot of schools in there. There's quite a lot of residential homes, um, parks, playing fields, etc. Now, clearly, the risk of stating the bleeding obvious, you know, there's, there's the chances for, for energy, particularly solar, um, small wind turbines, um, and also uh, using that land for, you know, is there a possibility of, a, you know, energy storage place, battery storage, you know, one of the most exciting things at the moment in the world of renewable energy is the growth in storage. It's always my view that energy storage and renewables should have grown up as sort of sister technologies from the very beginning. Um, sadly, uh, I think this is partly the technological challenge and I occasionally um, want to point the finger a little bit at renewables who wish to sort of deny the intermittency and unpredictable nature of their, um, their uh, product. They didn't want to kind of put that in the shop window. Um, they should have been honest about it from the start. We should have been developing these, you know, for the last 30 years alongside the turbines and the solar. We haven't been. We are finally doing it. And it just, you know, it, it is the, could be the biggest game changer. If we can get battery storage to be cheap, then that will really, really make a difference because then obviously you, you know, the, your, your um, renewable energy is available when the sun ain't shining and the wind ain't blowing. And uh, you know, those, but those things will need land, they will need, they will need space. And I'll, I'll come on to land, land use a little bit more. But there are other things in terms of energy, you know, uh, that planning is very involved in. Um, can you, you know, in, in some of the conservation zones where you have rules and regs about solar panels, really, do we not need to sort of reflect a bit of the urgency about this at the moment? Does that sort of thing need to change? I know my, my sister, who doesn't live anywhere near here, um, but she's um, in an area where they're planning on putting massive solar panel, um, uh, solar farms around the village, <laughs> uh, which people are... Uh, for reasons that you might be here as well, are sort of equivocal at best about, particularly because they're not allowed to put them on their own homes, and they just think this is, you know, particularly particularly weird. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think that with planning, there surely needs to be more of a presumption in favour. Now, I know that the national planning policy framework is a, a set of handcuffs under which you have to work a lot, but once again. You know, show that you're trying. Can you get though? Can you help? And it won't be just you alone, because of the, the, one of the things I haven't really talked about. But I'm sure you know that, that there is going to be a coalition of those councils who've who've developed these frameworks. That's something you need to be need to be pushing at. Um, transport. You know, when it, it, some of this it sounds incredibly banal, but you know, we need more cycle lanes when a new housing estate is, is built, there must be a cycle, a clear, dedicated, separated cycle route to get it to the services and to the schools and to the whatever. It shouldn't be a, oh, well, there's not enough road space, or who's going to pay for it? You know, it's just, these days it's just got to be an unarguable. We've got to have that. These things have got to appear. And they've got to be built in relation in our existing, in, into our existing infrastructure as well. And then, you know, you can move on to, 
you know, electric cars getting free parking, you know, everything to encourage walking, walk, walk, walk. Um, and you can lean on businesses here too because the provision they provide or the incentive they provide, you know, when they're seeking to do it, can you make it a condition of expansion or whatever that they, that they, they put in these kind of changes. Um, and uh, the businesses, I think, are worth focusing on in some detail because I mentioned the problem with trying to bring everyone along and electorates earlier. The nice thing about businesses, when it comes to this sort of subject, is they ain't democracies, and if the, if the bosses decide that they want to change something, they can pull some pretty big levers. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've no idea of the environmental credentials of Vodafone in your patch, but I'm sure you could uh, get them to improve them anyway or, you know, encourage them. But, you know, there are lots of other employers here, clearly, um, uh, that they can be encouraged to do a better job. And just on transport, your own... This brings me to uh, another, uh, um, another approach to this, is that I think... When it comes to delivering on your declaration of a climate emergency, do you do it on the basis of concentric rings? What can we do in our own property and uh, our own place as West Berkshire Council first? And are we, what can we do and are we doing it? I, I passed a van of yours on, on the way here and I was thinking, small vans, there's a massive opportunity to go electric with those because most of them do predictable length of journey. They don't suddenly have to travel to Thurso because their aunt's ill, you know, which is what gives arguably the rest of us, you know, range anxiety in our electric cars. And turning the, the fleet of um, your own vehicles, for instance, electric, must be something that should be considered. Now, I know it costs money, so <laughs> I'm not saying this can happen overnight. But, and then again, in your own, you know, have you done your own um, carbon footprint analysis um, in terms of fuel, in terms of heating, in, in, in terms of uh, even maybe in terms of, of diet and food in, the, in, in the, the, um, your employees uh, when they're at work and you know, coming to work. Because I think coming to that bit that I was pointing out earlier, that if people are suspicious that those who are telling them to do this stuff are not doing it themselves, that's when you'll very quickly run into trouble. So you need to be showing that you're doing it. And I think this sort of idea of concentric circles, focus on what you can do first, you know, then look at, you know, for instance, the housing under your control, and then look at the roads, and then look at things that you can influence, then look at new buildings. You know, I think building out like that is going to be a more robust way of doing it um, in, in, in terms of really, really delivering um, these changes. Um, can you consider offsetting? I don't know whether this is a... So the idea of offsetting, which is you... you if you know you're delivering 10 tons of carbon, you pay for the trees to be planted which would absorb 10 tons of carbon, or you pay for technology or something to be developed in um, our own part of the world or some other part of the world that will, that will absorb 10 tons of carbon. Now, offsetting has had a slightly checkered reputation in recent years because some people think it's an excuse for uh, poor behavior, or sorry, uh, I couldn't put that pejorative, excuse, excuse for uh, climate unfriendly behavior. Um, Having said that, you know, you could argue, well, it's better to, better to do it than not, and there could be a big fund of money that will be put aside for doing these things. Now, I don't know whether there's a question mark about whether you're allowed to use council taxpayers' money for offsetting. Interestingly, at the BBC a few years ago, we went through a discussion about whether we were allowed to use the licence fee for offsetting the, uh, for instance, the, you know, the flights of... Uh, the Blue Planet team around the world, or indeed the flights of the Countryfile team, who occasionally we do take flights uh, around the UK. And it was decided, no, it wasn't a good use of license payers' money. Personally, I'd like to see that reviewed, uh, because I think it, it, it's, it's an, an open question. And would, yes, it would put the cost of those things up, but then in that in itself is an incentive to think about whether we should be, we should be doing them. So could, we, could offsetting be part of the, uh, part of the uh, plan for... for councils. Um, just briefly on waste, um, I don't want to talk too much about this, but um, because th there is some overlap between waste and climate change, but it's not as, uh, uh, not as big as some people actually think sometimes, and I'm, I'm uh, slightly alarmed occasionally by what I consider to be uh, a sort of rise of plastophobia, because 
Um, you talked about plastic free and, you know, that's kind of mad, really. I mean, yes, single use plastic uh, and, and the disposal of plastic is a real problem, but plastic is a fantastic product. You know, I've had this bottle for two years. It did, didn't actually take much energy to make. It's extremely light to carry around. You know, I think you've just got to be a little bit careful about some of these uh, things, not least because they can have perverse consequences when it comes to climate change. I think one of the ones I'm, you know, like, like the move to glass milk bottles. Really? They're very energy intensive to make, they're heavy to carry, and actually the recycling of plastic milk cap bottles is really, really good. I've lost count of the number of aluminium bottles I've been given free in the last two or three years by people wanting to virtue signal that they're, aren't they good? Are they, and at least two of them have been by the BBC. One a Blue Planet, Planet branded one and one a Countryfile branded one. Um, aluminium is one of the most energy intensive things to produce. Now it's slightly better if you're basing it on recycled aluminium. And also it, the, the, the toxins that come off the uh, production, there's this whole, the areas that produce a lot of aluminium, they're suddenly dying in this sea of red sludge, which we can't do very much about. And there are huge pools of this stuff. I think it was what caused an environmental disaster, was it in Romania about two or three years ago when one of these things broke? So, you know, just got to be, be, be kind of, be a bit aware of the kind of fever around some of these environmental issues. Land use, um, in uh, Richard's, uh, figures that he put up earlier, he said he couldn't read, I actually could read, uh, and that land, the, the land use and farming has been one of the failures in inverted commas when, inverted commas when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. Um, now, I, I, do, you, do you actually have, you can ask, do you have county farms here? You don't, you don't, right, so there are no actual farms under the, uh, under the council, but nevertheless you have you have influence over, you know, how decisions and, and maybe planning decisions, again, that are made on farms, whether it be um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of new buildings or in terms of um, you know, energy and behaviour and things like that. And, 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 you know, I just think, once again, I mean, Rich's film obviously mentioned farming big style. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there are an awful lot of things that can be done in, in the farming area, uh, whether it's carbon sequestration, locking up more carbon in the soil, um, agroforestry that's growing crops am amongst trees, or silver pasture, which is grazing amongst trees, which is very effective, and planting trees. I mean, you mentioned, you know, you do have land. You do, you, planting trees is something that I think, you know, I'd very much like to say. I talked about the danger of sort of uh, fevers of, of, of things and getting a bit obsessed by things. I think planting trees is something it's kind of worth probably getting obsessed by. There are some downsides, but there aren't, aren't very many of them, and generally they're, I'm, I'm, I'm biased in favour of trees, I'll say that as a BBC person. Um, and interestingly, I think actually things like XR and the, and the school strikes, need, I think they need to think a little bit, having made their point so absolutely brilliantly uh, in terms of protest and anger, I think they do need, there is a thought about whether they could be using that fantastic resort, mobilised resource, into a bit more sort of, you know, delivery type things. You know, should we be seeing a, uh, you know, a school strike day when across the country they're trying to get involved with planting trees? Or should, you know, should we see something, I mean, I know this isn't directly climate change, but, you know, litter picks or something like that? Because I think not only would it show that they're not just uh, about... Um, uh, being angry and protesting, but they're also about delivery of, of solutions as well. And I think that would help them to appeal to yet another constituency, which would be, would, would be a very good thing. Um, in, 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 um, it's just possibly the, the, one of the trickiest ones for you guys, because uh, I know that three quarters of your area is an area of outstanding natural beauty. You know, where are you going to stand on the, the, the big issues of um, wind turbines and uh, solar panels in, or at scale, solar farms? Now, I do think that it is a, I mean, that onshore wind has been a bit of a, bit of a dead end for the last few years following this administration, you know, basically uh, suggesting it, it wasn't something it wished to support. Now. I think that's a bit of a shame because nationally the figures suggest that about three quarters of the population are in favour of it. They may not be the same three quarters that live close to it, I grant you. 
Um, having said that, you know, some people, you know, there is no doubt that a wind turbine is an extraordinary thing in a landscape, and it does look a bit like it came from another planet, and you either like that or you don't. But I do think that as the urgency and the need for low carbon energy has increased, I do think there slightly needs to be a greater challenge to the assumption that there is a sort of a massive, massive NIMBY uh, opposition to these things. And just in terms of solar panels, uh, I know there is a feeling that there's a, or can be, a big sort of uh, food versus fuel. People don't like to see them on virgin farmland. I think there is an option that solar panels and biodiversity can go very, very well together. So you can have solar panels, you know, and, and make an active decision to make, combine that with a, with a meadow, with somewhere that is a really, really powerful habitat. Now, some of the solar developers will push back against that, because yes, it costs them a bit more than just putting the panels down and glyphosating the hell out of the land underneath. But I think, you know, once again, if you are giving planning permission for this, can you say, yes, we will, but only if you deliver something for wildlife alongside it. And I think that not only helps the wildlife, I do think it helps the people who are you know, next to it and don't like the idea of tin foil spread across the fields near them, which, which isn't um, what they immediately liked. It wasn't what appeared in, in Richard's film of the beautiful countryside. You know, it, it, it was largely devoid of those things. So we've got to face the fact that, that it isn't necessarily what people immediately like. You know, can we find ways of um, squaring that circle? This is what I mean about it. it needs a kind of political smarts to deliver these things. And finally, just in terms of the concentric circles, I know what, you know, what, what you'll all be uh, faced with is, is the question of, yeah, well, we can do so much in this country, but it's not worth it when China's doing nothing. That's what you'll hear on the doorstep. People will say, well, why should we bother? Well, I have to say, it is, there's no denying that it's quite a potent argument. It's not, uh, it's not flawless, but it is quite potent. And I'm just going to try and those are some of the flaws in it. First of all, China and India and these developing countries, these big developing countries, are doing something. <laughs> they are the big, uh, particularly China is the, you know, the biggest developer, developer and um, installer of um, renewable energy. Um, and in fact, their, their coal graph has been flat to slightly declining. Now, it's not declining enough. And they are also investing in coal plants across the world, which is clearly something terrible. But it is not true to say they're doing nothing. And you can kind of paint the, 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 what they're doing in, in two different ways. And they do, you know, they, they are interested in, not learning by example, etc. but the example of other countries changing is, um, does have an effect on these countries. And we saw uh, Narendra Modi, uh, who's uh, Prime Minister of India the other day in, at the UN, making some quite bold commitments in terms of the growth of solar uh, and wind he hopes to see in India. And it works quite well for countries like India because their grid is a bit hopeless. So they don't necessarily want a system like ours which has massive centralised, or like we had I should say, that has massive centralised generators and then relies on uh, lots of pylons uh, to get it around the country uh, because that's an, uh, investment, an extra investment they have to make. So this kind of more, de more decentralised generation system could well work in these countries. So there is some good things happening there. Um, and, and I also thought that uh, just in terms of what I, uh, uh, you know, uh, talked about concentric circles, I think you're perfectly at liberty to say, look, these are the things we can do that are under our, our control. And it's not necessarily, you know, it's difficult enough for me to control what happens in the rest of Britain as a councillor in, here in uh, uh, West Berkshire, let alone what happens in China. So I, I think, you know, getting your own house in order first is something we can all subscribe to. And I did just wonder whether there's an opportunity in the, um, in, in the town twinning area here. Because I saw where you're, you're uh, forgive me our pronunciation, but I saw where you're twinned with, I think it, this was probably Newbury's question, Braunfels in Germany, bagnol sur seize in France, Eclo in Belgium, Feltre in Italy, and this is a really tricky one to pronounce, uh, C A R C A I X E N T in Spain. Carcassonne? I don't know. Anyway, can you compete with them for the greatest reductions in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, carbon or in, 
you know, the greatest climate change effect. Can you actually involve some of these other countries around the world? I've always wondered slightly what town twinning for, is for, apart from lovely breaks for mayors, which uh, I'm not saying is a bad thing, but as long as they go by train. Um, but uh, would this be a way of actually helping to make that, that mean something, to reach out to other countries and say, this is what we, uh, we, we could be doing? And finally, and this is a thought a little bit beyond... Um, arguably, well, definitely beyond the remit of this council, actually. Um, but I do think it is important, and it was mentioned in, in passing, I, I think, by Richard in terms of the, the circular economy. Having said that it's difficult to get people to change their behaviour and change their lifestyles, we do need to move to a new definition of a good life that isn't simply ba based on consumption of stuff. And... That is going to take time, and it will be very rocky along the way, I think. It was mentioned by, there was recently, there was a report that came out this year which did for nature what the IPCC you know, does for climate. It was called um, IPBES, and it was about the glo a global report on the biodiversity and nature of the world. And the author of that, you know, kind of in amongst it, said, you know, we need a new vision of a good life, something that isn't just based on GDP. Um, but, as we know, uh, just saying, oh, we should consume less immediately, we, know, we slightly know what that looks like. It looks a bit like a recession, and, you know, real people suffer. So we need to think of a way of retooling the economy to move it so the circular economy actually means something in terms of people's pockets, in terms of their, their wealth and well-being. And I think that is a sort of a broader direction of travel but cracking that may be a little bit beyond the incredibly powerful council of West Berkshire. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Tom. Um, I am very conscious of the time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tom, for that excellent uh, presentation and certainly has uh, prompted, I'm sure, much uh, food for thought. Um, I am prepared to take two questions, I think. It will f foreshorten, obviously, your lunch. Any questions? One at the back and one here, and that will be it. Thank you. That gentleman... That there's a gentleman there and a lady, I think. I'll take the lady and the gentleman at the back. Um, you were used to be famous as a market town, fast becoming a supermarket town like many others. Um, how do we address the role of the big supermarket groups and the conspicuous consumption that provides? <laughs> um, so, in terms of, I'll try and narrow that in terms of, of, of climate change. Um, uh, just to slightly counteract uh, what you're saying, in many ways, um, the, our decision, so the, the delivery of goods in a full 40-ton truck to a supermarket, and then we go there and fill our car, um, and we go there rarely, because we do it at a big shop, is actually quite a climate-friendly way of behaving. What is a it can be a bit of a challenge is doing, you know, we think that, oh, going to the local farm shop is great and we'll go and buy our meat from there and our veg from there. You want to be careful about that in terms of climate. There are real, there are real questions about it. So the efficiency of supermarkets is not necessarily a bad thing in terms of climate. They do, I would agree with you, there can be a temptation to over-consume and waste food as a result of that. I was just at a conference chairing a conference last week in Berlin, something called the Sustainable Retail Summit, where the uh, retailers were coming together and trying to drive this. They are trying, or they claim to be trying, to reduce their own food waste and reduce over, um, over consumption, over shopping, you know, buy one, get one free, and all these things, which, to be fair, have actually disappeared a little bit in the last few years. They're not nearly as common as they were in supermarkets. Um, but in the end... I don't know. They, they like selling us stuff. That's how they please their shareholders. So they like to sell us a bit more. But I wouldn't make them public enemy number one in this debate, I must say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a teacher, and my students are all over this, absolutely. Uh, but you mentioned uh, the sugar tax and how successful that has been. You mentioned the Vodafone and getting um, leaders of companies. So I'm interested in your view on the um, nanny state versus <laughs> 
Um, I think I, I am quite in favour of a little bit of, let's not call it nannying, but, but leadership uh, from, from governments. I mean, the... the, the, <laughs> the uh, the thorn, the, the, the most tricky one on this now is about meat, obviously. Because, you know, if you think behavioural change is difficult in general, dietary change is, is really difficult. And um, the aforementioned Claire Perry, the minister, was, was very allergic to suggesting anything, even about eating less meat. So I do think uh, there is a massive role for government to, to lead. I do think... Um, there is, I mean, you, you, they are just going to have to be bold enough to bounce off the nanny state accusation because it's going to happen. And I think the successes of uh, the plastic bag tax and, and, and the sugar tax and some of these things uh, should prove to them that if you get it right, and I think you need to be careful about sort of sculpting the, the mood music around it, because I think... But the real danger is when it's combined with a feeling that you know, we're being told to do something that they're not doing themselves. And it's been quite interesting. I think people were quite surprised. Well, it, it's a fact that people were quite surprised by how interventionist Michael Gove, when he was at DEFRA, was prepared to be. You know, they thought, well, I mean, this guy's supposed to be a sort of fairly... Um, and they slightly misjudged his background, actually, but they sort of thought, oh, he's a red in tooth and claw, you know... Um, uh, enterprise above all else, kind of free marketeer, and he's actually been quite surprised, quite willing to suggest, you know, things like deposits on um, uh, plastic um, cups for, for for coffee and and, and indeed plastic bottles um, for drinks bottles, uh, and and so I think we are going to see some more of that, and I think we should, and I just think they're going to have to. Learn to be. Uh, we can, you can take this up with Richard. Uh, <laughs> learn, learn to be brave about, um, you know, bouncing the criticism off them. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, and uh, thank you, Tom, for the answers.